Dobrze, dzień, dzień dobry, dobry wieczór. Moje, moje przemówienie dzisiaj będzie po angielsku. Józef mnie prosił, żebyś to robić po angielsku. Mamy goście zagraniczne, ale chciałem udowodnić, że są obcokrajowców, którzy mieszkają w Polsce i potrafią mówić waszym trudnym językiem. Uh, ja, jestem ciekawy, uh, ile z was pracujecie dla takiej dużej korporacji, big company? Ile pracujecie dla taki startup albo średnie, małe, średnie przedsiębiorcy? Uh, I ile jesteście sami przedsiębiorcy, czyli entrepreneurs? Ok, super. Ostatnie pytanie, ile, ile z was jesteście ambitni? 100%. Wiesz skąd ja wiem? Jest piątek wieczorem. Możecie być w domu z dziećmi, z żoną, kochankę, e, mąż i jesteście tu. I dla mnie to jest ogromny symbol, e, że piątek wieczorem jesteście. Ja akceptowałem zaproszenie od Józefa, bo bardzo wierzę w jego misji, oności, rozwój i inwestycje na e, human development. So, I'll now go into English, but um, my speech tonight is called The Test of True Leadership. My career, my life is about leadership. I've been doing it since I was 21 years old and started in a large corporation, Procter and Gamble, and then some years later started my own business. And I still invest in my own leadership development constantly, reading books, going to seminars, learning. I do a, a program at Harvard Business School every few years, and I would say if there's one bit of general advice is never stop learning, never stop investing in yourself, which is exactly what Youssef's mission is with um, the organization Leadership Island. So um, very quickly, just tell you my background. So uh, Youssef did a much better job than I could do, and I wouldn't say all those things, but I came from a normal family, not very rich, got a scholarship to, actually quite poor, got a scholarship to university, went into corporate life, worked for Procter and Gamble, uh, got a scholarship to a great business school, went into management consulting. I had a very comfortable American life in New York City and Connecticut. At the same time, on the other side of the world, here, there was a revolution going on. Vawensa Solidarność brought down the communist system that I thought was unimaginable in my lifetime. And someone called me and said, John, how would you like to leave your comfortable life and move to Krakow, Poland, where? <laughs> Krakow, Poland, and work for one year as a volunteer helping the Polish nation get started in its mission to create a democratic capitalist society. That was in 1990, six months after the fall of communism. And I quit my very high paying job and came to Krakow and worked for yeah, 2 million zlotych. I was making 200 zlotych per month to come over here to leave that life because I wanted to be a part of the excitement that was happening in Poland. I thought I would come for one year. This was the uh, spoem in the building I lived at in 1991. Soviet troops were still in Poland. It was not a very attractive place, great potential, but not that much. And I just thought I'd come for one year and go back to my nice life in America. I decided to do it. So I left that, I came to Poland. Kind of ironic that I chose this photograph after Yusuf's introduction. Um, and so I became a pioneer. I did not define myself as a pioneer. Other people started saying, well, John Lynch, he's a pioneer. He came to Poland in 1991. Poland, where's Poland? You know, Americans, they're not really sure where all these countries are over here. Um, but I explained where it was and thought I would be here for one year and go back. Well, something happened along the way. I fell in love with Poland. Not a Polish girl, just Poland. Although the Polish girl did come along some years later, uh, I just loved this country and decided to make my life here. And I've been living for 25 years in Krakow. More than some of you are alive, I suppose. I, after one year, I was supposed to go back to the States and I decided to stay. And I made a second decision that changed my life 
which is to start a company. I did a startup before the world even used the word startup. <laughs> we would just call it a new business back then. So I started, this is my Steve Jobs photograph. <laughs> Six of us in a little room uh, printing t-shirts. We were one of the first companies in Poland that sold t-shirts and clothing with logos, with uh, Kraków, Polska. There was no company doing that at the time. Very, very small business. Today, the business has expanded. We have 300 people. We sell all types of clothing to Starbucks or KFC, British Air, all over Europe in 25 countries. But it started with three people in a back room and no money. We had almost no money when we started the company. So it's as humble beginning as one could imagine. Now, my talk is the test of true leadership. And what I've written, if you read on the website, the test of true leadership is when you hit a crisis, when hard times come. The, the story of Apollo 13 and the crisis they faced, I was almost getting tears in my eyes. I've watched the film, I know the story. I actually have a photograph of the first moon landing in my, in my bedroom at home. Um, because that is when real leadership is tested. When the business is growing and making money and adding people, everything's going great. Of course, leadership is important. But when things get tough, that's when your true leadership comes out. Now, I was mentioning uh, in, our, in our prep session that having been an entrepreneur, Przeczom for uh, 20 some years now, I have faced almost every possible crisis you can imagine. I've had suffered recessions where all of our sales go down the drain. I've had employees leave and start a competitive company and steal clients. I've had big international competitors come in and try to kill us. Uh, we've run out of money completely, had no money to pay salaries, and I'm using my credit card to pay salaries. Every difficult thing that's possible happened to me in those 24 years. So I've realized that I've matured as a manager as I face new crises. As an example, the crisis last year was when uh, somebody called me at seven o'clock in the morning and said, the warehouse is on fire. <laughs> and I'm driving in the car to school to drop my kids off. I said, is everybody okay? He said, yeah, everybody's okay. Is the fire department there? Yeah, they're here. So, nobody's hurt? No. Okay, I, I have to go to school, drop the kids off. I'll be there in half an hour. <laughs> I handled it very calmly than I might have handled it 20 years ago. So one of the little things to pass across is every single person in life, their life goes like this, up and down. We all have good days and bad days, good months and bad months, and good years and bad years. So one of the keys in being a good manager and a great leader is knowing that when the bad time comes, it's more than likely gonna come back up again and stay calm during your crisis. That's the real sign of a great leader. The leader who starts panicking makes everybody else in the organization panic, no matter what the crisis may be. Now, the business started small and it grew rapidly over the years. For the first 10 years, I paid myself almost nothing. I had this great background, great business, and I was over here earning almost no money. And it was frustrating, and I kept wondering when it's gonna happen, but finally, after 10 years, the business starts to take off, and I'm feeling excited about it. Everything's going great. I raised venture capital, I raised private equity. We went from three employees to 10 to 50 to 150, now it's at 300, so it's just been a, a wonderful progression. And then, when everything seems great, the nightmare occurs. I'm not gonna talk about it too much today. I, I met Yusuf when I did a TEDx talk in Kashmir, which you can find online, it tells the whole story. So the point today is not to tell the story of what happened, but basically, after spending 20 years building my company and 
loving my company. I've got some fantastic people from my company with me today. I have a great personal relationship with the team. That an, a hostile investor came to take over the business. And one day when I was in Florida, which is where NASA occurred, I had my Houston, we have a problem call. My call was my CFO calling me to say, John, you're no longer the owner nor presence of Linka. You're out. The other shareholders have maneuvered you out of your company. And the way they did it was they came to the business in these big black vans full of SWAT people and the girls were there when it happened and everybody was terrified and they physically took control of my company. It's maybe not quite as dramatic as uh, Apollo 13, but I can tell you for those who were in the business and for myself, it was horrifying experience. I was locked out of my own business that I built every day for 20 years and not allowed back in. They had guards around the company preventing me from coming back in. I thought they were going to kill what I've spent 20 years building. Now that's a crisis. That was a crisis beyond any crisis I'd ever faced, personal or professional, in my life. And I learned so much during that crisis. I actually carried a little notebook with me as it was happening. And each time I learned something new, I started to write it down. I'm, as I said earlier, I'm very much into learning all the time. And I was finding the word in English is epiphany. I can't remember the Polish word. But when you have this realization, you think, wow, I never really saw the world that way. That was happening to me constantly throughout the crisis. And at the end, I saved up all these notes and put them into a little presentation to share some of the things that I learned during my own crisis. And if a few of them help you in your careers, just pick one or two maybe someday. I hope you don't have any crises, but I have to warn you, more than likely you'll face some as you're going. So I was in a David versus Goliath situation, a large international fund with much more money, with big law firm, with all kinds of resources, were trying to basically take the business from me and I was fighting back. It had a happy ending. You can see it uh, on the TEDx talk. Basically, after a long, long struggle, I got the company back, and I attribute it to faith and love, love of my company, my employees, my family's support for me during the time, and the faith of never giving up. Maybe you saw in the beginning, my title is Keeper of the Faith. There are not a lot of CEOs whose title is Keeper of the Faith. <laughs> And it came up during this crisis because I would meet my team. They were told, if you meet John Lynch, you will be fired by the team that came in. So people were really scared about what was going on. And yet they would meet me. We'd meet in secret places. We'd meet in pubs and stuff to talk about things. And every time I said goodbye, I said, guys, keep the faith. We're going to get through this. So giving the team confidence during the crisis was the biggest thing I could help with. And I said, keep the faith. So many times, my crisis lasts 15 months. This is not a week or two or a month or two. 15 months, every day, I thought, I'm going to lose 20 years of my hard work of building this company. So keep the faith became my slogan. It's on my business card. It's on all my emails. I believe it very much. And since this crisis ended, um, I have plenty of new crises all the time. And I still say, guys, we'll get through this. Keep the faith. So here are my 10 and a half lessons that I learned during my crisis. And a big part of it is how to conquer the power of fear. Because fear is the thing that brings people down. Fear of your business failing, fear of whatever it may be, personal or professional. And that's the biggest lessons I learned. So lesson number one, when I was in a crisis, I had many, I had so much to do to manage this crisis. So many things to deal with, with lawyers and staff and trying to keep the business alive, even though I was outside, I wasn't allowed in my company, that it would have been a perfect excuse for me not to do the other things in my life 
that make me happy, like going to my little boy's soccer game or going to my daughter's dance rehearsal or going on a date with my wife or whatever. It would be a perfect time to say, I don't have time for that. I need to focus on my crisis. And what I learned was even when in a crisis, it's the best time to step out of the crisis and do the normal things that make you happy. Do the normal things in life and don't use the crisis as an excuse to not do anything else. So that was a big lesson for me. As a matter of fact, most of the clear thinking I had was when I left the crisis and I did something else because then my brain would be relaxed. Your brain doesn't work very well when it's stressed. Lesson number two, the power of fear on yourself, on your staff. You could ask the people who worked at Lincoln, everybody was scared. Are these other guys gonna kill the company? Is it gonna go bankrupt? Are we, are we gonna lose our jobs? What's the plan? And it really distorts yourself from thinking clearly when you're feeling fear. So whatever mechanism you could come up with, and I have a few I'll share with you, beating fear is a big part of, of all crises. I think the positive attitude theme has come through from many great speakers, Tony Robbins and people like that. And I learned the same lesson. Number three, you can't go it alone. There are people who like to solve their problems by themselves. They don't want to share with too many people. They feel proud. They feel that I can, it's somehow a weakness to share your problems with other people. And in my own family, there's some people who talk openly and some would just like to keep it to themselves. Well, big part of my successfully dealing with crisis is I'm very open with people. I have a picture here of Dalai Lama because in the middle of my crisis, when it was really, really intense, I received an invitation to have a very small private meeting with the Dalai Lama in, in Prague, in Czech Republic. 25 people with the Dalai Lama for about three hours. And I really had no time to go to that. I had legal deadlines, I had huge pressure, and I thought, how many times in my life am I gonna get invited to meet the Dalai Lama in a small intimate setting like that? And even though everything said to me, don't go, I said, damn it, I'm gonna go. And I got in my car, I drove six hours to Prague, I went to this meeting, it was one of the most inspiring things of my life, and probably, it played no small part in me making it through this very stressful 15 months. Each time I felt like maybe the big heart attack is coming, and I have to say there were many times that I felt my life was endangered through the fear of what was happening, I would close my eyes and do this little meditation thing and just picture the Dalai Lama and, and it gave me strength. So again, it was stepping out of the crisis and getting help from anywhere I could get it. Number three, this is interesting. I'm not gonna give you this as advice, but beware of advice. I found that many, many people are happy to give advice without knowing very much about your specific situation. As a matter of fact, no one could ever put themselves in your shoes to understand all your situation. Maybe you have, maybe you can't quit your job because you really need the income. Maybe whatever, but each person has. So my one thing I learned is I received lots of bad advice from people and I say always beware of advice. But there's a second thing I learned and people all the time in business say, trust your gut. I don't know how to say that in Polish exactly, uh, exactly but believe yourself, see what your own instinct says about dealing with the situation. And I found that my gut, my instinct was wrong at least 50% of the time, that I got into a situation and I thought, well, the best thing to do here would be this. I would meet with my trusted team and they would say, no, John, I wouldn't do that. I think we should do this. So it's the advice thing again, but they're not, they're just making arguments. I listened and I th finally thought, you know what? You guys are totally right. I was wrong. My gut's wrong. And you need to be strong enough to know when you trust your gut. Because at the end, as a leader, the decision is yours. So you are trusting your gut. But if you go in with a strong opinion and don't listen to those around you, you'll be worse off. 
Number five, use humor as a stress reliever. There was one of the bad guys who was trying to steal my company who I started referring to as the rat or shturek. And in every conversation, I would ask people, I'd never call him by his name. I'd just say, what's the rat doing now? How's the rat? And people would giggle. I see, the, see uh, Monica and I are laughing now because they know who the rat is. Um, but it made us laugh. And the, the weapon against stress can be humor and laughter. So even in the most dire situation, humor is a great tool and a great weapon to deal with the stress to get yourself thinking clearly again. Here's a simple one. In my crisis, one of my friends said to me, John, read The Art of War. It's a very, very famous 5,000-year-old book, Sun Tzu, and uh, it's not that long. And if you haven't ever read it, I strongly recommend to read this book. Whatever your business career might be, it's fantastic on negotiation, on strategy, on being small against a big competitor. And... Uh, it's absolutely relevant for, for these days. And I read that in my crisis and it had a major impact on my strategy. One part is pretending to be weak, pretending to be uh, afraid of the other guy. He felt strong and sure because I was acting weak. What I was doing was buying time to get my strategy organized. And it's exactly what Sun Tzu writes about. If your enemy is bigger, pretend you're weak. Number seven, for a tough negotiation to succeed, you must be ready to walk away, whatever the negotiation is. And this is a tough thing. And people I know who are professional deal makers in real estate or businesses like that, they know the only way they can get the deal, the best deal possible, is to be able to walk away. You just say, thank you very much, but I'm not interested. You walk away, and they come chasing after you. Wait, 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 okay, we'll give you 10% more off. Okay, now we're talking but you have to be ready to walk away. It turned out to be an important part of my own. Number eight, the importance of a plan B, whatever it may be. If you're planning to walk into your boss and say, I demand a raise, a podvishka, um, then you've got to have a plan B. We've had people who's, who gave their, their resignation uh, uh, thinking it's going to convince the, the, the managers to... Uh, give the guy the podvishka, and we just said, oh, thank you very much, and let them go. So you got to have a plan B, whatever your negotiation or situation is. It gives you the guts to fight for your plan A. My plan A was to somehow get my company back and get the bad guys out. My plan B was to start a brand new company. I said, okay, if I'm going to lose my business, i got to start another one. I'm not going to go home and cry. i got to do something here. I also had a plan C and a plan D. Number nine, distance yourself from bad news. I have a great friend who runs a very successful company, and during the last big recession, we were talking about how we were handling things. He said, you know what I do? I take myself out of the bad news. My company needs me to be positive and creative and come up with solutions. If I'm getting emails every 10 minutes about something else that went wrong, it's detracting me from being the best I can to find solutions. So distance, and be careful about these worst case scenarios. Oh, uh, we can't pay the bills and the company's going to go bankrupt. I'm going to end up in the street. I'm going to be sleeping under a bridge. My family's going to leave me. Some people do this worst case scenario things. I think in Poland, probably a little bit more than let's say in America. So be careful about worst case scenarios. They don't really help. And they almost very, very rarely actually happen. Number 10, very simple one. Write down your ideas. Be organized with your thoughts. In my crisis, I was having so much change so dynamically that I was always writing everything down. At the end of each day, I would review what I had written down, and sometimes I'd completely forgotten what I was thinking about at 9 o'clock in the morning when 9 o'clock at night came. And I'd look at my notes and think, wow, good thing I wrote that down because I completely thought about that brilliant idea. And last, 10 and a half lesson learned. When you have a heart attack, they give you CPR. They revive you, bring you back to life. But as a leader in a crisis, it's not usually your heart that's the problem. It's your spirit. If you're the leader, whether it's of the whole company or your team, 
you need to show the team that you still believe, that you still have the faith. And how do you pick yourself up when you really don't feel very good? I heard during one of these big crises that the company knew exactly what kind of mood I was in based on how fast I walked down the hallway. When I left my office and went down to Monica's area like this, everybody said, oh, things must be really bad. John's walking slow. <laughs> so I realized that my mood and my energy is critical for the team to be up. And I found that I can manipulate my own spirit. I can manipulate how I feel by using silly, ridiculous things like blasting my favorite song in my car, which happened to be Keep the Faith by Bon Jovi. So I would blast Bon Jovi in my car, and within about a minute, I'm feeling better. And then I was like, okay, I can deal with this. I watched, during my crisis, Rocky won about 12 times. <laughs> Every time I get the day, I felt terrible. I go, hey, Jake, you want to watch Rocky? He says, yeah, Dad. And we go over, we watch Rocky, and at the end of it, I'm feeling good again. You can manipulate your own spirit by doing things that make you happy. Tony Robbins and others also talk about that. So when you're down, when you need that boost, whatever it is that picks you up, do it and manipulate yourself back into a positive mood. And there's my Rocky. So I think I'm at my 20 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention today and keep the faith. <laughs>